Greetings once again from the Cornish Radio Amateur Club and today's slide video is about the transmitter and if you have your uh, RSGB book, uh, the advanced manual called Advance Handy, you should turn to page 44. So here we have the generic block diagram. Uh, and we will need to have some knowledge of this for the examination. We won't need to be able to draw it, of course, because it's a multiple choice examination. But you should be able to um, identify the function of any of the boxes. And a typical question will uh, have numbers instead of words in the boxes and um, will ask you, you know, what is the function of box number three, etc., etc. So, to help you do this, um, there are a couple of boxes that you can eliminate from um, having to remember. First of all, you have on the extreme left there a microphone, and a microphone will obviously always be connected to an audio amplifier. And that should be fairly easy to remember. On the right hand side, um, you have the antenna, and just before the antenna is always the output filter. The output filter, I think, was introduced at intermediate level, and if you recall, is there to prevent any harmonics or any spurious out of band signals being transmitted to air. And connected to the output filter, of course, you must have an RF power amplifier. So if you like, that's three boxes ticked without having to um, remember too much. After the audio amplifier, you've got a box with two inputs and one output. That's the modulator and filter. And one of the inputs is a crystal oscillator. Uh, and the other one is, of course, the output from the audio amplifier. So the audio amplifier is mixing with some RF and modulating that RF in one way or another. So if you have a box with uh, three connections, in other words, two inputs and one output, it will either be a modulator or a mixer. So there we have the generic um, block diagram again, and we're going to start looking at what signals we might find as we travel around this block diagram. Out of the audio amplifier, we will of course have audio frequencies. And if you recall, the audio frequencies that uh, are used for voice in the amateur world are 300 hertz to 3.4 kilohertz. And that is quite adequate for um, passing voice. It wouldn't be adequate for a music broadcast, but as we're not allowed to do that, um, 3 kilohertz of bandwidth is, is fine. After the uh, modulator and filter, we'll find some intermediate frequencies. At this stage, the audio frequencies have been, modulate, have been used to modulate the RF produced by the crystal oscillator, and some intermediate frequencies have been produced. And these frequencies will depend on the modulation scheme selected. After the mixer, where um, some uh, frequencies from the crystal oscillator and frequency synthesizer pair are mixed in, we get up to our final frequency, the, the frequency that we want to transmit. Perhaps that might be 14.035 uh, megahertz, for example. And <clears throat> because the mixer will give us um, the final frequencies and potentially some unwanted frequencies. If the modulation scheme, for example, is um, uh, AM or FM, uh, it'll differ. But we'll have some sum and difference frequencies there, and we'll want to pick off the ones that we that we want. Um, they will then go into the filter and RF driver, and only the ones that we want are selected at that point. And the level is increased a little bit uh, from the mixer level to enough to be able to drive the next box, which is the RF power amplifier. 
And out, out, out of the uh, RF power amplifier, we will have the high power that we're sending off to the antenna. And we may also have some harmonics or unwanted frequencies. If the RF power amplifier was perfect, and the filter in the RF driver was perfect, um, then we wouldn't have any unwanted frequencies. But if we're overmodulating or something like that, there is a possibility of uh, harmonics or unwanted frequencies, and these are removed by the output filter. And therefore, at the antenna port, we have a clean output. Let's have a look at the boxes at the bottom. The crystal oscillator, well, that's a fixed oscillator. Uh, and will be giving us uh, a crystal frequency. And that crystal frequency will be uh, used to drive the frequency synthesizer. And the frequency synthesizer is essentially uh, a multiplier or divider composed of logic. And that will pr provide the frequency that we want to go into the mixer. That won't be the output frequency because the mixer will mix the crystal oscillator frequency uh, from um, that's connected to the modulator with the synthesizer frequency. So it'll be um, either a sum or a difference of those two frequencies. Uh, and after the mixer, we'll have the final uh, frequency plus any mixing products that occur. Here we'll have the final frequency, as we said before. And now we'll have a look at uh, some of the boxes individually. Looking at the left-hand box there, uh, we've got the audio amplifier, the crystal oscillator, and the modulator and filter. And if you recall, uh, that comes from the generic, the left-hand three boxes of the uh, generic uh, diagram. So here we have them. Out of the microphone, we'll have um, potentially a low level signal, but potentially with quite a wide bandwidth. If the microphone is a high performance microphone, for example, it might be able to pick up signals uh, far higher frequency than we wish to transmit. So although our voice may not contain too many components up to 12 kilohertz, um, things like banging the desktop or perhaps music playing in the background could easily generate frequencies that are in excess of the frequencies that we wish to um, transmit. And the maximum frequency we wish to transmit would be about uh, 300, uh, three, um, 3 kilohertz. So there's the area that we wish to select. So that's the job of the audio amplifier so that after the audio amplifier, we've got 300 to 3 kilohertz. The crystal oscillator will be a crystal oscillator operating perhaps at about 6 megahertz. And that will provide RF into the modulator and filter. The audio amplifier will provide audio into the mod modulator and filter. And the output of the modulator and filter will depend on the type of modulation selected. And we'll be talking about the different modulations later on in this video. So there's our generic block diagram again. And there are the three boxes three blocks within the block diagram that we've covered so far. Now we're going to have a closer look at the crystal oscillator and frequency synthesizer. Let's start with the crystal oscillator. <coughs> 
should recognize the uh, transistor oscillator there as um, a common collector that the uh, collector sorry big pardon the common emitter the emitter is um, common both to the input circuit which is the uh, crystal oscillatory circuit on the left and the output which is labeled on the diagram you should recognize the bias transistors there and you could guess from the values there on the bias transistors that this uh, transistor was biased uh, into class A operation looking at the values the um, bias seems to be not exactly halfway between the rail and zero volt but uh, certainly quite a way up so it looks as though this transistor oscillator is running as a class A oscillator you should be able to recognize there the load resistor in the collector circuit recall that a um, transistor is a current amplifier and to translate this into voltage amplification we need a load resistor so that we can pass that current in the collector emitter circuit through the load resistor and provide a swinging voltage and you should recognize there the oscillator circuit remember that a crystal can either have series resonance or parallel resonance and so you need to uh, select the correct one uh, when you uh, at design time uh, you should recognize that this is a Colpitz oscillator because of the two capacitors there in the base emitter circuit and note the 5 to 35 picofarad capacitor in series with the uh, crystal that's there just to um, uh, that trimmer is there to make uh, small calibration adjustments to the crystal the capacitor can pull the crystal a little bit one way or the other and so you might use this if you were calibrating the oscillator and you might think well how does that green uh, oscillatory circuit get power what, how is it managing to oscillate well if you recall the emitter follower circuit this is using a part of an emitter follower circuit if you like as the current flows through the emitter to collect a circuit the voltage at the top of that 1k resistor will change there will be a voltage swing on that and that's what provides energy to the green oscillatory circuit let's now look at the uh, synthesizer part of the uh, phase lock loop well <clears throat> at the top there you'll see the crystal reference oscillator which we've talked about and that comes down to a fixed divider and it says divide by A that will be used in a formula which we will uh, generate in a minute which needs to be used in the exam and let's say that the crystal reference oscillator is a 6 megahertz oscillator and that the divider is a divide by 6000 divider that will leave 1 kilohertz out of the fixed divider now the fixed divider will be um, a logic circuit providing uh, um, fixed division there there's no tuning or anything required for that The one kilohertz circuit, the, I beg your pardon, the one kilohertz signal will go into the phase comparator and will be compared with a feedback signal. And this will provide a DC reference to the voltage controlled oscillator. And the uh, DC will determine the output frequency. And we'll look at this in a bit more detail now. So the programmable divider will take the output frequency 
divide it such that one kilohertz is fed into the phase comparator. And the programmable divider there, you can see lots of arrows going into it. That represents a data bus. And there may be a binary signal on that data bus. And ultimately, that will be connected to the front panel control. That's where you select your frequency for your transmitter. And so it might be 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, etc. So <clears throat> the frequency out is equal to the crystal frequency times n divided by a. And that frequency, that uh, formula, I beg your pardon, that formula you will find in the formula sheet uh, in the examination. But you should try and remember that. The divider is n, the um, programmable, the fixed divider is a rather, the programmable divider is n, and you should be able to um, generate the output frequency from that formula, given the crystal frequency, uh, fairly easily. That should be a nice, easy question. You should also remember the um, structure of that uh, block diagram. Let's have a little look at how this works then. Well, out of the fixed divider, the six kilohertz, uh, the six megahertz, I beg your pardon, was divided by six thousand and gave us one kilohertz. That's the reference frequency. If we drew the waveform of that, it would be something like that. That will go through a phase comparator providing DC to a voltage control oscillator which will provide the output frequency, the output of the VCO. And the green star represents the point on the diagram where you might get something like this. Now you may notice that the VCO output is shifted in frequency and therefore in phase very slightly from the reference frequency. So, we can see how much it has uh, differed, and that's the job of the phase comparator. And so the phase comparator output will be a logic signal, something like that, square wave if you like. If that is passed through the low pass filter, that will provide a reference uh, voltage, that will provide a voltage control rather for the VCO. And therefore will uh, adjust the VCO back to where it should be. So any voltage produced by the uh, phase comparator because of a mismatch between the reference frequency and the VCO uh, frequency uh, phases will tend to adjust itself and negate itself back to um, square one. Another method of uh, providing um, a VCO output is direct digital synthesis. Direct digital synthesis, or DDS, works by having a sine wave lookup table. That is, um, a series of memory addresses where the absolute values of a sine wave are stored. These are clocked out at a variable speed into a D to A converter, a digital to analog converter, and thereby producing the voltage 
of the instantaneous values that were stored in, mem in memory. This is passed through a low pass filter to smooth it and gives a sine wave output. By turning the knob on the front of the transmitter or transceiver, the frequency control, the speed at which the instantaneous values are read out of memory into the DTA converter is varied and therefore this changes the uh, sine wave output frequency. Now this may need to go through a buffer amplifier. Uh, here we have a circuit of a buffer amplifier. Um, we don't need to spend too much time on this because from previous videos we're already um, familiar with this common emitter circuit. Returning to the uh, direct digital synthesis, uh, one of the disadvantages is that because the uh, instantaneous values uh, that are read out from memory are uh, discrete values, we don't have an absolutely uh, smooth curve produced out from the sine wave. It comes out in little quantized levels, and this tends to produce a jagged waveform. That's why it needs to be passed through the low pass filter to smooth the waveform. Another way of producing uh, frequencies is using a frequency multiplier. In this circuit here, the RF from a previous stage is fed in at frequency F. And the tuned circuit there, the LC circuit, is tuned to that frequency F. If you look at the NPN transistor, you'll notice that the base, from a DC perspective, is connected to the zero volt rail. That means that the transistor is operating in class C mode. The output is tuned to something like 2F or 3F, in other words, the uh, second or third harmonic. And because the transistor is working in class C mode, It's working on the non-linear part of the IC VBE curve. And because it's operating on the non-linear part, it will be producing harmonics. So that the collector circuit will resonate at either second or third harmonic, depending on what you've tuned it to resonate at. So the input frequency is F. The transistor is biased to class C. It's operating on the non-linear part of the curve. And it's producing mixing and harmonics, which are selected by the output circuit in the collector circuit of the transmit of transistor. Let's have a look now at a, an FM transmitter with a frequency multiplier. And one of the disadvantages of using a frequency multiplier. If the output of the oscillator was had a center frequency of 72 megahertz, And that would be where the yellow star is. And the range of frequencies was such that um, the modulation products were between 71.995 and 72.005. These are the sidebands produced in FM. And we multiplied this by 2 in a frequency multiplier, 
our output would be at 144 megahertz. But if we multiply 71.995 by 2, we get 143.990. And similarly, if we uh, multiply 72.005 by 2, we get 144.010. So whereas we were occupying 10 kilohertz before multiplication, we've effectively increased our frequency deviation so that we're now occupying 20 kilohertz. So this needs to be taken into account in the design. And this is one of the reasons that uh, frequency multipliers are not really uh, greatly used at uh, VHF. But frequency multipliers are a good solution at much higher frequencies. SHF and above. On the screen there you'll see a waveguide um, device with an N-type connector on the back of it. And if we look at that, diagrammatically, that's what we've got. Now we'll be covering waveguide later on in a subsequent video, but suffice it to say that the higher frequencies waveguide is far less lossy than coax. Also, the size of the waveguide um, cavity uh, is very important in selecting frequencies. If you like, you can consider waveguide as like a low loss feeder and a filter all built into one in as much as it has a low cutoff frequency and a high cutoff frequency. If we introduce into this device um, a diode and inductor that are uh, resonant, because the diode is running in the non-linear part of its curve, it will produce harmonics. And if we introduce this physically into the waveguide cavity, then the harmonics will be naturally selected by the dimensions of the waveguide cavity. So then we might say we've got UHF in and SHF out. And depending on the components selected, we can get uh, multiplication factors that are quite high. So in the next part of this video, we're going to have a look at the different types of modulation. We're going to have a look at single sideband modulation, SSB, amplitude modulation, AM, frequency modulation, FM, carrier wave modulation, CW, otherwise known as Morse, and have a look at data modulation. So let's start with SSB. There's our audio spectrum, 300 to 3 kilohertz. And there are the left-hand three blocks from the generic transmitter block diagram. If the crystal oscillator was operating at 1000 kilohertz or megahertz, then after we put the audio spectrum shown into the modulator and filter and the crystal oscillator in as well, that is what we would see on the output if we looked at the spectrum analyzer. We would see the lower sideband the carrier, and the upper sideband. Now, <clears throat> if this started off, although we're saying SSB at the moment, this is effectively an AM signal. And 
and we've got the two sidebands and the carrier. And with a modulation index, uh, modulation depth of one, and we'll be talking about that uh, later on, uh, the maximum that we can get in either sideband is 25%, and 50% will always be in the carrier. So if we go back to look at SSB, if we filter away the lower sideband and the carrier, we've got upper sideband. And we can do this because we're not losing any information in that process. The lower sideband is simply a mirror of the upper sideband, and the carrier doesn't contain any information. So, on the input to our receiver at the other end, we have all the information we need to be able to reconstruct the voice. And in the video on receivers, we'll be looking at how this is achieved. But, if we look again at the uh, two sidebands in the carrier, we can also filter away the um, carrier and the upper sideband just to leave the lower sideband. And which sideband we select is simply a matter of convention. There's no particular technical advantage to um, using either USB or um, LSB. The disadvantage of um, using this filtering method is the fact that we are using losing a lot of power and because the carrier is such a high level close to the um, sideband our filters need to be very very sharp such that the carrier doesn't get through in any appreciable level and this is very difficult to do. So we use a diode ring balance modulator. And there's a picture of the diode ring balance modulator. Looks a bit like a bridge rectifier. Notice that the uh, transformers on the input and output are center uh, tapped. And that is where the RF input from the oscillator is applied. Then audio input is applied on the left and a double sideband signal, but with no carrier, comes out on the right. So this produces a low level of carrier so that it's easier to filter off the unwanted carrier and sideband. Our filters don't have to be quite as sharp. Let's have a look at the um, result of looking at AM and FM on a, an oscilloscope. If we had a signal going in, an audio signal, perhaps of one kilohertz, and that was modulating a carrier, that's what the AM signal would look like. The amplitude of the uh, audio signal modulates the envelope of the carrier. And this is what it would look like on an FM signal. The amplitude of the audio signal modulates the frequency of the carrier. You can see that when You've got peaks in amplitude of the modulating signal. The frequency at the bottom is at its highest. And when you've got troughs of amplitude in the modulated signal, the frequency of the FM signal is at its lowest. You can see that because the sine wave stretches out. The period of the sine wave increases, and that's inversely proportional to the frequency. So let's go back and have a look at AM. That's the AM signal that we produced before. 
if we only put two tones on it, uh, and we looked at it in the spectrum analyzer representation, those two tones wouldn't appear as uh, big sidebands, but as simply the sum and different frequencies out of the mixer. And so if we had a one kilohertz tone on a thousand kilohertz signal, we'd have 999 kilohertz and 1001 kilohertz. We'd just have the sum and the difference frequencies. Now, <clears throat> if we manage to um, modulate the signal such that we uh, are able to um, completely uh, modulate the carrier by 100%, such that at our peaks in level, we get the maximum, and our troughs, we get virtually zero carrier going out, then the maximum that can be theoretically achieved with AM is 50% of the power in the carrier and 25% in each um, sideband. Let's have a look at the modulation depth and how we uh, establish what that is. Um, if we look at the signal at the top there, labelled A, that is the unmodulated carrier. And the distance above that, B, is the peak modulation. So the modulation depth, M, and we talk about modulation depth for, for AM and SSB, and we talk about modulation index for FM. So the modulation depth, M, is B over A. And if M is 100%, or M equals 1, sometimes expressed as percentage, um, then we will get 50% of our power in the carriers, uh, in the carrier and 25% in each sideband. So the maximum power that's able, that's available to transmit useful information, if you consider useful information all contained within one sideband, is only 25%. Now that formula is in the formula sheet, I think, but you should be able to um, recall that for the examination. You should also recall that the maximum power that's available in a sideband in AM is 25%. If we over-modulate AM, in other words, we turn up the signal on the input such that uh, we either get clipping on the maximum part of the envelope, or we get the minimum part suppressed so much that nothing is sent, then we have overmodulation. And if we have overmodulation, we will get distortion, information will be lost, and potentially we will get interference with uh, neighboring frequencies. Let's have a look at um, FM again, and AM. The AM signal there is not overmodulated because you can see between the peaks in the envelope we still have some modulation occurring. And there we have FM once again, the peaks on the input signal corresponding to the highest frequency on the modulated signal. So this is how FM encodes the information on the carrier. High amplitude, high frequency low amplitude, low frequency. So, FM, let's talk about deviation. 
The carrier varies or is deviated according to the amplitude of the modulating signal. And there's no natural limit to the amount of deviation. It's a matter of design. There is a natural limit to modulation depth because when you get to a modulation depth m or 1, any further increase will simply cause distortion. But for FM, there's no natural limit to the amount of deviation. The peak deviation is the maximum that the carrier is allowed to deviate. So when we've designed our FM transmitter, we might choose a maximum deviation. And the designers for FM entertainment broadcasts have chosen plus or minus 70 plus and minus 75 kilohertz because they need that amount of deviation to be able to carry music at high fidelity. Parameter transmiss transmissions it's common to use plus or minus two and a half kilohertz or plus or minus five kilohertz. So this comes up now to a couple of definitions that we need to know. The deviation ratio is the actual deviation over the maximum deviation. So <clears throat> this means that if you put a tone of 1 kHz onto an FM transmitter, the deviation that's actually occurring over the maximum that you have allowed the uh, transmitter, that you will allow the transmitter to deviate to, is the deviation ratio. The modulation index is the peak deviation over the maximum audio frequency. So remember that in the amplifier stage, we have a filter, and our filters are normally set to 3 kilohertz. And if our peak deviation is 2.5 kilohertz, then we would see that the modulation index would be 2.5 over 3. Let's have a look at that. Here we have it, FMMI, modulation index. So for the wideband example, the music, the modulation index for the entertainment FM channel is 75 kilohertz over 15 kilohertz. That might be the top frequency that's being transmitted. And that would be a modula modulation index of about five. And <coughs> because it's greater than one, by convention, we call that wideband FM because the modulation index is above five. For narrowband FM, narrowband is used for simple voice, or perhaps data modes. For narrowband FM in the amateur uh, two meter band, the modulation index would be 2.5 kilohertz over the maximum frequency that's transmitted, which is actually slightly less than three kilohertz, it's 2.8 kilohertz um, specific specified for the uh, two meter band. And that would give a modulation index of about 0.9. Um, and because that is uh, modulation index of less than one, we call that narrowband FM. Now let's have a look at the concept of FM bandwidth. We had one kilohertz going into an FM transmitter. Then um, what would happen is that, if you can see there on the spectrum analyzer display, you would have um, a set of side tones set up. The carrier then would be at um, 1 kilohertz. Obviously, this would be uh, 1 kilohertz plus whatever the RF frequency was. Um, but to keep the uh, mathematics simple, we'll just call it 1 kilohertz. And you'd have um, side bands at side tones at 1 kilohertz spacing um, going down and going up. And these side tones are. Um, very uh, very in level, but reduce generally. Uh, the trend is that they reduce um, as we uh, move away from the center frequency. Now the amount of um, bandwidth that uh, is occupied um, is uh, given by Carson's rule, and this is a rule of thumb. But roughly speaking, the bandwidth will be very close to. Uh, twice the sum of the uh, maximum deviation plus the maximum modulating frequencies. So two brackets FD max plus FM max close brackets.
So let's have a look at an example of that. So for the 2 meter amateur band again, the bandwidth will be 2 times 2.5 kilohertz, that's the um, maximum deviation, plus 2.8 kilohertz, which is the maximum modulating frequency that is allowed through our audio amplifier, uh, and that would equal 10.6 kilohertz. So we would use 10.6 kilohertz of bandwidth at RF. Now it's worth noting that that's quite a lot. We're only sending a maximum audio frequency of 2.8 kilohertz. And I think later when we look at SSB, we'll see that um, for SSB, if we were sending 2.8 kilohertz of, uh, as a maximum frequency, that would also be the, the maximum bandwidth. So FM is not very efficient, even narrowband FM, on bandwidth. This is why FM is restricted generally to use of uh, use in frequencies of VHF and above where there is more room and it is not used in the HF bands where bandwidth is at a premium. Now let's have a look at applying uh, FM uh, to a practical example. Here we have in the blue uh, area of the screen, the Colpitz oscillator. Once again, you would recognize that by C1 and C2. And there's an LC circuit on the input of the uh, Colpitz oscillator. And um, uh, we have um, a DC bias coming in as labeled. Um, and uh, we have a audio coming in. And those are uh, mixing in the varactor or variable capacitance diode and therefore providing a variable frequency on the output of the Colpitz oscillator. Let's move on and look a little bit at phase modulation. Um, <clears throat> in our standard block diagram for a simplified uh, transmitter, either FM or AM. Um, phase modulation is very similar to frequency modulation. Frequency modulation precisely controls the frequency uh, by passing the output of the audio amplifier into the oscillator, as we saw on the preceding circuit, where the audio coming in um, and that was changing a reactor diode, which changed the output frequency of the Colpitz oscillator. Phase modulation precisely controls the phase. So the audio is fed instead to the buffer amplifier. So I think this is an exam point to remember, that for an FM transmitter, the audio is fed to the oscillator, and changes the frequency of the oscillator. For a PM or phase modulation, a phase modulated transmitter, the audio is fed to the buffer amplifier. And here is a stylized representation of phase shift in phase modulation. You can see that the first cycle there on the left is suddenly changed in phase according to the input information and um, produces an output uh, that's phase shifted. Now it's very difficult on an oscilloscope to spot the difference between phase shift modulation and phase modulation and uh, FM modulation because in changing frequency you necessarily change phase and in changing phase you necessarily change frequency. Let's have a little look at the concept now of rise time. If we have a sine wave and uh, at a certain frequency, and we have the third harmonic of the same frequency, and we put them together and add them up, 
so that each point on those curves, we add the sum of the curves, we get an output like that. And that output would be the fundamental F plus the third harmonic. Now you can see that the blue curve there is starting to look like a square wave. If we continue to add to uh, that um, sum of frequency, we add the fifth, the seventh, the ninth, etc., etc., adding odd harmonics, the square wave will become a squarer, it will have a faster rise time, a flatter top and a uh, and a, and a uh, faster fall time until ultimately we'll get to a um, perfect square wave and we'll get there when we've got the first harmonic plus the sum of all of the odd harmonics up to infinity in practical terms we don't have to add too many odd harmonics before we start to get fairly reasonable representation of the square wave. So there's a perfect square wave. There's a square wave with a rounded edge, so it's still a fast rise time. And here's one with a slower rise time and a slower fall time. And you can see that you can fit a very high frequency within that square wave. Very, uh, very high frequency sine wave. So we could say that we could fit in the fundamental plus the order harmonics up to infinity. Well, not quite, but up to a very high amount. With the rounded edge, it starts to limit the highest frequency that we're able to fit under the curve, under the square wave. And we could say that there's a fundamental plus we can get in a fairly high odd harmonic. But with the slow rise time, the fairly rounded square wave, if you like, we're not able to get a particularly high odd harmonic in. And this is why if we take a square wave and we put it through a low pass filter, it rounds off the curve. So you can think of a square wave as being having very high frequency components in it if it's got a fast rise time and not such high frequency components in it if it has a slow rise time. And this comes on to the uh, concept of um, CW, Morse and key clicks. So the idea then is not to have too fast a rise time when you press the key down and um, uh, and and uh, and produce a, a carrier wave. So this circuit here, where we're actually um, switching the uh, emitter resistor, is one that is quite often used for uh, more circuits. So with CW, it's called carrier wave. The carrier is on or off. But if the rise time of the carrier uh, is too fast, it produces sidebands. Morse, at its best, should produce a very narrow spectrum, perhaps about 300 hertz or even less, um, in terms of the RF uh, space that it occupies. But if the rise time is too fast, um, these um, carriers will extend uh, excessively, the sidebands, uh, and um, that will be detrimental to the transmission. So on the next slide, we're going to look at uh, data modulation and uh, particularly RTTY, or RITI. And this was the earliest, one of the earliest form of uh, data used by amateurs. Obviously, Morse was the earliest, but this was later on. And RTTY stands for Radio Teletype. Uh, characters are coded into five units. They used to be coded on a paper tape, and you can see a paper tape there with um, some of the letters there. There's a lowercase and an uppercase for uh, numbers and letters. 
and that would be fed into one of these machines and then produce um, an output which then could be transmitted to the other end where the same machine would read the input and print the uh, characters on a piece of paper. And there's a picture of a very early mechanical machine. Now the um, concept of mark and space came in about this time and I think the holes represented a mark and the absence of a hole was a space. So the concept of mark and space is um, there in data communication. It's a bit like a one and a naught. And for amateur radio, there are a lot of uh, data modes. And this is info only, we didn't need to know those. Amateur teleprinting over radio, Amtor. D-Star, which is um, a data mode of 128 kilobits per second. Hellschreiber, or Feldhell, or Hell. Uh, discrete multitone modulations, such as multitone 63, MT63. Um, multiple frequency shift keying. Modes such as FSK441, JT6M, JT65, and FT8. Uh, Olivia, packet radio, automatic packet recording system, Pactor, phase shift king, etc., etc. And at the bottom of the list, RT2Y. You don't need to know these, it's just enough to know that there are plenty of data modes out there, each one with its advantages and disadvantages. Now, I digress slightly to have a look at the band plan here, because in the next example, we'll be sending data at about 7 uh, megahertz, which is at the end of the band plan. This is not to imply that we should send it there, but the example is given for simple arithmetic and for showing uh, what happens if we um, are not careful and how we can exceed the legal limits. It is quite legal to send data um, at um, 7 megahertz. Um, that's not a problem, uh, but you wouldn't uh, get very many friends because you wouldn't be adhering to the, the band plan and that would annoy people. Um, but um, it's not a matter of legality, rather good operating practice. So the next example isn't meant to imply that you can send or that you should send uh, data at 7 megahertz. But here we have it. Let's have a look at an FM transmitter. Uh, and uh, there are essentially three ways of sending data over radio. And this is the first. An FM transmitter, where we are introducing audio tones. So that's called audio frequency shift keying, AFSK. So if, that, if you like, there's the uh, standard FM transmitter. and uh, in a very simplified way, there'd be an audio amplifier, which would be fed to an oscillator, um, a PA, etc. That would be PA and low pass filter, etc., and off to an antenna. The audio amplifier, we've been through this, uh, changes the frequency of the oscillator according to the amplitude of the signal coming in. And I've got a microphone connected to the audio amplifier there. If we take the uh, microphone away and instead uh, connect a computer or more specifically the um, output from a computer's sound card, then with a, a, an appropriate program like FLDigi on the computer, we can um, send tones from the sound card um, AF output into the audio amplifier. It may not actually be in the same connections as the uh, microphone, but um, for practical purposes, it achieves the same result. And then we have a look at the spectrum then. And we were transmitting at um, uh, 7.002, which is in the uh, CW part of the um, band plan. But if we were, then for FM, uh, we would find um, sidebands coming up with the mark and the space tones, which are represented on that diagram by solid and dashed lines, at um, approximately the frequencies shown. And this is because uh, we're using FM, we're putting an audio frequency in, and those are the um, sidebands that come up in FM if you put an audio frequency in. In our case, we're putting two in, one represented by the uh, dash and one 
represented by the dotted line. And you can see that unless we've got some good filtering in, we will be transmitting out of band. So that's the precaution we have to take. So there's the carrier. So I beg your pardon, there, there is the uh, space tone and the mark tone. And there's the carrier. And we transmitted that signal to the other end. And we took our output from our receiver and put it back into a similar computer running a similar program, we should be able to see what was sent from the originating station. And these are the FM modulation products. So this is putting audio into an FM transmitter. And as far as the ITU, the International uh, Telecommunications Union, is concerned, the designation code for that type of modulation is F2B. It's F because it's frequency modulation. It's 2 because it uses an audio subcarrier. That is the sound from the, uh, the, sound, the tones representing mark and space coming from the computer. And B because it's intended for automatic transmission. In other words, you're not pounding away on a Morse scheme or anything. It goes out automatically. And if you're interested to look up the ITU uh, modulation designation codes, you can simply Google it and you'll find that um, there's a, a huge variety of um, codes for different types of modulations. So, second way is with an FM transmitter, but instead of feeding into the audio amplifier, we feed directly into the um, oscillator. And that uh, implies that we have a device on our computer, or maybe a third-party box that we can connect to our computer that produces DC, or more correctly, uh, a sort of square wave um, DC, which is used uh, to connect directly to the oscillator, um, and if you remember, in the FM transmitter, quite often we use a varactor diode or very cap diode. And by changing the voltage on that, capac that um, diode, we change the capacitance of the diode. And that, in turn, changes the frequency output of the oscillator. So in this example, we're using a DC waveform or a square wave waveform, data waveform, to directly modulate the oscillator and we're bypassing the audio amplifier stage. And because we are directly uh, instructing the oscillator what frequencies to send, we only send those two frequencies. And there's no risk in this instance of any out-of-band transmission. We're simply sending the space frequency and the mark frequency. So this has a significant advantage over AFSK, this is now FSK, frequency shift keying, in as much as the occupied bandwidth is far less than using AFSK. So if you're asked what is the advantage of FSK over AFSK, the advantage is significantly less bandwidth is, um, is sent out, is occupied. So the ITU mod, uh, modulation designation code for this is F1B. F, again, because it's frequency modulation. 1, because it's without an audio subcarrier. Remember, it was 2 before, because it did have a, a subcarrier. And once again, it's B, because it's intended for automatic transmission. So this one, FSK, is... Um, F1B. The third method, general method of sending data over the air, is with an SSB transmitter using audio tones. And this sometimes is called SSB AFSK or sometimes just AFSK. So 
Here again we have the AF output from the sound card going into an audio amplifier, but because we have a, an SSB transmitter, we have a balance modulator this time, not a, an oscillator, uh, and then the other stages, the PA, etc., going off to the antenna. And this time we have the two tones being sent out, and because it's an SSB transmitter, we have a suppressed carrier. I've shown a little bit of carrier leak there just to show where the carrier would be, but in an ideal situation there would be no carrier there at all. Again, we would only have the space and mark frequencies. So this is actually indistinguishable in terms of the output from option 2, which was the um, uh, F1B um, transmission, the uh, FM FSK transmission. So it's interesting there that you can either have uh, an FM FSK transmitter or SSB AFSK if you like and essentially get the same output. And the ITU modulation designation code there is J2B. J for SSB. 2 for audio subcarrier, there is an audio subcarrier used in generating the output, and B is intended for automatic transmission. If we overdrive uh, the SSB transmitter, uh, and I said that the, there would be a program on there, something like FLDG, and I've used some of their output from their manual, the FLDG manual, that shows what happens if you uh, overdrive the AF. In other words, the AF level is too much into the audio amplifier and hence into the balance modulator. This is what can happen, and this is a gen general rule for all um, cases where you overdrive or you overmodulate um, the uh, signal. So here we have a spectrum analyzer display, and that part of the display, those are the two tones, the mark and the space. And you can see that the frequency of a mark in audio terms is 1000 hertz, and the space is 830 hertz. That's shown at the bottom of the screen. And that's all you should see uh, if it was operating correctly. But because this is being overdriven, we've got some other peaks um, occurring on the spectrum analyzer display. We've got a carrier, which is poor suppression. The balance modulator shouldn't produce a carrier, but if you over-modulate it, the carrier will leak through, so it's carrier leakage. Because we've selected upper sideband, we shouldn't see any lower sideband, but there is the frequency corresponding to lower sideband space. And in the upper end of the graph there, we can see quite a few peaks, and they are the second and third harmonics of the mark and space. And because we're overdriving the balance modulator, we're producing uh, harmonics, which of course is undesirable. These are harmonics of the audio frequencies, and so these are difficult to filter out. This is what we call splatter. These are not harmonics of the RF frequency, but harmonics of the audio frequencies on the RF output. So, let's see where we are in terms of the uh, transmitter block diagram. We've covered the audio amplifier, the crystal oscillator, and the modulator and filter. We've had a look at the frequency synthesizer, uh, and we recall the formula for that, uh, the frequency synthesizer and the crystal oscillator. We've had a look at the uh, crystal oscillator, a Colpitz oscillator, and we're able to recognize that as a circuit diagram. And now we're going to look at mixing it up to the final frequency.
So you can see that instead of the uh, crystal oscillator and synthesizer at the bottom, I'll replace that with a single block, just calling it a VFO. And for the example that we're going to go through, we're going to say that that is a VFO capable of going from 7.8 to 8.35 megahertz. And we'll be looking at the RF amplifier and the output filter later on, but we'll discard those for the moment because we're looking at mixing up to the final frequency. Later on we'll look at how to take that final frequency and boost it and send it to the antenna, but at the moment we're just looking at mixing it up to the final frequency. So there we have it, a 6 MHz crystal oscillator in this example, and a VFO of 7.8 to 8.35. Now, <clears throat> if we mix those two frequencies together in the mixer, uh, the 7.8 and the 6, the difference frequency will be 1.8, and we will obviously restrict how high the um, VFO goes so that we're able to produce frequencies from 1.8 to 2 megahertz, in other words, top, top band in the amateur band. Uh, similarly, um, we would be producing 13.8 to 14 megahertz, and these would be unwanted frequencies. So it will be for the filter and RF driver, or the filter part of it specifically, to filter out the 13.8 to 14 megahertz frequencies. And that shouldn't be too difficult because the frequency separation between the wanted and the unwanted frequencies is quite wide. So, out of the mixer in a typical transmitter, we might have a number of filters. We could have uh, filters switching for the uh, 80, uh, 160 meter band, for the 40 meter band, etc. etc. So, that would be a typical arrangement that we'd come across switched filters depending on the band selected um, to, uh, to, pr to produce the desired output. So we go back to our generic diagram again. As I've said, we've covered the audio amplifier, oscillator, and modulator. We've covered the frequency synthesizer and crystal oscillator. And we've uh, covered the mixer and filter and RF driver. The RF driver is something just to give a little bit more level before it goes to the RF amplifier. And now we're going to have a look at power amplifiers. Power amplifiers for FM and SSB. So Class A amplifiers, remember, give linear amplification. They're low efficiency. Both for transistors and for valves, if you have current flowing in its quiescent condition, then the frequency is bound to be quite low. So remember Class A, there is current either flowing from the um, emitter to the uh, collector, or if you're looking at conventional current, collector to emitter, or from uh, the uh, cathode to the anode all of the time, even in the absence of a signal. But when the signal comes in, it never drives the um, uh, device into cutoff, and so you get a faithful and linear representation of the output on the input, uh, on the uh, on the output of the input. That's class A. Class A B push pull can give linear amplification. So that's two um, class B or maybe slightly into class A um, devices working in a push pull configuration, so that they're only conducting when um, the uh, signal is uh, present, um, but they do cover both half cycles in, in their entirety. And if we have any type of modulation that has a variable uh, envelope like AM or like uh, SSB, we require a linear amplifier. Uh, 
where we don't have a variable envelope like FM or phase mod, frequency modulation or phase modulation, um, and that doesn't have amplitude changes, then we can use a non-linear amplifier, e.g. class C, and that's not, not normally suitable for, for FM, for example. And CW also does not have significant amplitude changes. It's either there or not. Uh, and also, for that, you can use uh, a class C amplifier. Now, let's look at an example of a low-power FM 2-meter amplifier. And here's the matching and filtering. Now, this is given in the uh, book Advance. And let's have a look at some parts of the circuit. Well, um, the input's on the left, and these components here provide some impedance matching and harmonic filtering. You've essentially got LC circuits there, um, and um, these will provide, uh, in, it's a tuned circuit, so harmonics outside of the desired range will be rejected, and um, uh, it also provides impedance matching to the preceding stage. You can see there the uh, RFC1, that's RF choke, uh, or inductor number one in the circuit, is biasing that base from a DC point of view to the zero volt line down the bottom. So you should recognize that as being class C biased. That's why this amplifier is suitable for FM. It is not suitable for SSB at 2 meters. There's the load. In previous examples where we had a, um, a common emitter amplifier, we said that the, um, the um, transistor is a current amplifier. So it needs some sort of load in the collector circuit to develop a voltage across. Well, we want to develop a voltage across it, but only for the um, RF part of it. And so that RFC2 will have high impedance at uh, RF, but a low impedance at DC. So it will produce a um, suitable RF output from that transistor. Here's filtering, L2 and the amplifiers, uh, and that should say L3, are there to provide um, filtering and matching to the um, output in the subsequent stages, which in this case is the antenna. Now, uh, filtering is critical for class C amplifiers because if you recall, class C amp uh, amplifiers are operating in the non-linear part of their curve, and if they're operating in that way, then harmonics and um, uh, spurious signals can be produced. So filtering is critical in order not to uh, transmit uh, unwanted frequencies. So there we have it, the a low power FM two meter amplifier uh, operating at class C. Now, power amplifiers in um, transmitters have various efficiencies, and we've covered some of this in um, our uh, transistor circuit configurations. So, class C. With class C, you can get up to 67% efficiency. It is non-linear and it's not suitable for SSB or AM. Class A is typically 35% efficiency. That figure will depend on how much, for example, in a transistor amplifier, how much it's forward biased. Uh, it is linear, provided it's operating on the linear part of the curve. Class A implies that it is. And it's suitable for most modulation types but it's very inefficient. Class B push-pull or class AB push-pull 
not much difference between them. It's just to the extent to which um, they capture the um, half cycle. If they capture just a little bit more than the full half cycle, then it's class AB. If it's just the half cycle, then it's class B. Uh, they can achieve up to 50% efficiency. Um, they can be linear, which is, uh, and they're very suitable for, for mains operation, and they're suitable for most modulation types. So let's have a look at how we uh, measure the output power of an SSB transmitter. So the maximum power output for SSB is uh, often stated as being PEP. And in fact, that is uh, what is mentioned on the license. You're allowed to radiate 400 watts PEP on some of the HF bands. PEP is the average power of one cycle at the crest of the modulation envelope. So if you look at that as being a, a rough modulation envelope, then uh, there's the peak, and there's the peak cycle, and the average power for this cycle should not exceed 400 watts. And that then is a, a license requirement. If we look at the effect on the equipment in terms of power dissipation, the power dissipation for voice will be fairly low because voice is very peaky, so not always transmitting at the full envelope, and gaps exist between syllables and words. So I've shown that on the diagram there. There's an average power. Um, there's gaps there between the words. And this means that the power, as far as the output transistors are concerned, in the transmitter, I mean, if it was a uh, class A amplifier and 70% um, of the power was being dissipated in the output stages, um, then the uh, average power for, for voice transmission would be um, considerably less than um, the peak envelope power. So if you had an SSB transmitter and you were on a QSO, perhaps it's a class B push-pull output, uh, you can talk away um, and your duty cycle, that is the percent of the time that you have the um, transmitter keyed, um, can be perhaps on a modern transmitter 100% and you can wrap it on without any fear of the transmitter getting too hot because the gaps between the words, the gaps between the syllables, and the fact that um, it's a peaky type of uh, transmission allows overall, on average, the transistors to dissipate enough heat to remain functional. But it's a different uh, picture for data. Data modulation will normally involve sending a mark or a space at full modulation or full power continuously. The average power over time will be much higher than voice. Heat sinks and PSUs may struggle with heat dissipation and you may need to reduce power accordingly. So it's recognized then that if you're sending data out, you're sending a carrier at full modulation, sending either a mark or a space um, all of the time, um, and indeed, if you're keying an FM transmitter, um, you're sending out full power all of the time. Um, uh, that is quite different to SSB, where when you're not saying anything, you're not sending out any power at all. And that sort of neat, neat, leads us on to uh, the next uh, topic, which is speech processors. Now, speech processors... Uh, seek to limit the peaks so that a greater average power is transmitted. So this means that um, if, if you're only allowed 400 watts PEP um, and this peak is reached during words, if you flatten off the audio power level at the tops, it means that the rest of the uh, word can be transmitted at a higher level. Now this changes the fidelity of the sound received 
but it does mean that uh, more power is going out through the antenna port and potentially received by uh, the other end. So speech processors seek to compress the speech into a narrower dynamic range and use that to transmit on average more power and therefore uh, get greater intelligibility at the other end. They're not applicable to FM because FM is sending out full power all the time anyway and changing the frequency of the carrier according to the amplitude of the modulating signal. So speech processors, they drive the transmitter more heavily with uh, consequent power consumption and heat dissipation implications. So now on to automatic level control. Um, we said that over-modulating a transmitter can cause uh, spurious signals. And we saw the example with FL Digi over-modulating data, audio data, um, into a transceiver or transmitter. So most transmitters have an ALC um, and it prevents over-modulation and thus splatter and harmonics and potentially damage to the transmitter. So ALCs are something you can normally, on my transmitter for example, you can switch it in or out um, and it controls the uh, peak level that is being sent out so that you don't over uh, modulate the transmitter. SWR protection is another feature of trans, uh, transmitters, um, particularly at um, VHF and UHF. The transmitter measures the, VSB, uh, the SWR and if it detects that it's too high, it reduces the power output. Uh, these are particularly used on VHF and UHF uh, transmitters and it protects the uh, output uh, transistors. So that leads us on to our final topic, which is uh, transceivers. So transceiver um, block diagram. Here's the same diagram that's in the book Advance. Um, I don't think it's necessary to know all of the um, blocks in this diagram. I don't think you're going to be tested on this, but it might be a good idea just to work it through uh, and to understand uh, what's going on. The key message from this diagram is that there are uh, shared circuit. There is shared circuitry between the transmitter and the receiver that is switched over as you move from transmit to receive. So oscillators are normally common to transmitter and receiver. The microprocessor determines the actual frequencies. Receiver intermediate frequency circuits and filters are often shared with the transmitter. And changeover circuits switch between transmit and receive to the antenna. So this concludes the rather lengthy uh, presentation on transmitters. It is uh, uh, pretty well um, laid out in the book, I think starting uh, at chapter uh, page 44, chapter 7, and I would encourage you to uh, read that well before the exam. Thank you very much.